Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending February 24th, 2018. First off, thank you to Navy Thomas 8, also known as Thomas H, for this first article. This is from Fox News. Jupiter's great red spot will evaporate in little more than 10 years, astronomers say. Now, this thing's been around a long time. It was first spotted in the 1600s, but it has been slowly shrinking. As a matter of fact, when it was first measured in the 1800s, it was four times bigger than the Earth. And then later on, Voyager 2 went past, and it was a little more than twice the size of the Earth. And right now, the latest sighting from the Juno probe is 30% bigger than the Earth. So shrinking very rapidly. So if it continues along this path, and that's the important thing too, if it continues doing what it's been doing, it will probably be gone in about 10 years. Now, you never know. It could stop. It could start growing again. It could split up into a couple of... Uh, red spots. You, you just don't know. It's weather, but uh, it seems like it's been consistent for all this time for hundreds and hundreds of years, so no reason to think, but you know, you're always surprised. It's like anything with predicting the weather, so it says Juno sent back stunning images of the great red spot last year as it dived close to the gas giant's atmosphere. It passed 9,000 kilometers above the 16,000 kilometer wide storm. It's going to do so again in April, but not quite as close, so they're keeping a really close eye on it and everything, so it says, uh, the longest storm known on Earth was recorded in 1994, 31 days, and uh, obviously this one's been lasting since, uh, what, 1665, so uh, who knows, maybe your last chance if you get a chance to look through a telescope at Jupiter and see the great red spot, because uh, your kids and your grandkids might not get a chance to see it. Next up, and this is a little bit, I don't know, coming from Popular Mechanics, they, need to, they didn't explain it anywhere in the article, at least to my... Um, way of thinking didn't explain it scientifically but it says single trapped atom photographed with regular camera an image of a single positively charged strontium atom held near motionless by electric fields has won the overall prize in a national science photography competition organized by the engineering and physical science research council uh, david nadlinger's photo of single atom and an ion trap was taken using an ordinary digital camera on a long exposure shot. Now this is a very good, I, I'm not going to try to put down anything about this, I'm just saying there's something wrong about the way they explain it, but um, you can see in the picture here, I'll put the picture up and I'll even uh, see if I can get a close-up shot for you. And you are seeing the results of trapping a strontium atom in between two of these needles that are about two millimeters apart, but what you're actually seeing is not the atom itself. You're seeing the glow from the atom because of the way it's being trapped and what's happening to it. It is uh, glowing and producing light. So it would be a little bit like me saying from a mile away, you're seeing the filament of a light bulb. Well, technically, you may be seeing the results of the filament of a light bulb if you can see far enough away on a dark night, you know, maybe a mile away. But you're not seeing the filament of the light bulb. You're seeing the results of the filament of the light bulb producing photons. So that's exactly what you're seeing now. Because if you actually look at it, and if you've studied any physics at all, or even uh, chemistry, you realize what the size of atoms are. And we're talking about um, the whole diameter of this thing is like around 400 billionths of a millimeter. So we're talking about light waves don't go down that small. So to be able to actually see something, you have to actually see light waves. So anything smaller than maybe blue, the blue spectrum, our, our light waves go from long red uh, green in the middle and then blue at the very, very short end. Once it gets shorter than blue light, our eyes don't really detect it. So you have to use things like electron microscope and things like that. So I'll read a little bit more from the article. Strontian atoms have a radii of around 250 billionths of a millimeter, rather large in terms of atoms, and when illuminated by a laser of the right blue-violet color, the atom absorbs light and re-emits light particles sufficiently quickly for an ordinary camera to capture it in a long exposure photograph. The winning picture was taken through a window of the ultra-high vacuum chamber that houses the ion trap in the Oxford University Laboratory. So they kind of, sort of, in an indirect way, explain it, but it still um, makes more... If, if you don't really explain it fully in layman's terms, I think it kind of leads people to believe that what you're looking at in this little, little tiny dim spot in the middle, you're looking at an atom and you're not looking at the, the glow produced by the atom. So. Next article and the last one. This is from The Verge, and it is, I, I said I wasn't really going to talk much more about SpaceX unless uh, something significant happened, but I think this is significant enough to be talked about. SpaceX tried to catch its rocket's nose with a giant net and just missed. Now, this is a very accurate headline, too. If you'll see, I'll put up a, a picture of the ship here, too, and it, they call it a giant catcher's mitt, and it's not 
far from wrong about that too. I mean, you've got this net that's not really that huge. I mean, it's only half the size of the ship, and the ship does not appear to be a very large ship. But uh, they did miss by several hundred feet, I guess, of catching this thing. So it says, uh, after launching the Falcon 9 rocket from California this morning, which was actually in the past, SpaceX used a giant net to try to recover the rocket's nose cone as it fell down to the Pacific Ocean. The first time experiment failed, however, one of the pieces of the nose cone missed the net, which was attached to the ship and landed intact on the sea surface. And you'll see on this picture, I'll show you a picture of it, it's landed on the sea surface, and it doesn't appear to have any significant physical damage from the impact. However, there is a problem since it was exposed to seawater um, that's going to be a problem with being able to reuse it again. I guess the contamination of uh, some of the inside parts with seawater would make it so that they can't really reuse it. But uh, it's the first try. I mean, it's like everything else. When they had the rockets landing, you had a lot of tries before you got the rockets to just land almost, you know, in perfect synchronization like we saw in that last uh, launch and uh, recovery of the two side boosters. Uh, it took a lot of failures to be able to make that happen, so it'll it'll probably take a few more times before they get really good. But hey, if you save you know five or six million dollars by recovering the snow cone each time, then you're saving quite a, a lot of money. So, yeah, I'll read one paragraph from it here. SpaceX has become famous for landing its rockets after launch so they can fly again, but the way SpaceX plans to recover its fairing is quite different from how it recovers its rockets. The Falcon X boosters essentially reignite their engines as they fall back to Earth, helping to control and slow their descent. A typical rocket fairing doesn't have any onboard engines, so SpaceX has equipped its latest nose cone with a guided system and thrusters, tiny engines that help to guide the pieces through the atmosphere when they break away from the rocket. Um, they also deploy thin parachute-like structures known as parafoils to slow their falls. So what they're going to do is next time around, they're going to get a little bit larger parafoil and attach to it so it uh, falls just a little bit slower, giving them a little bit more time to get this net underneath. So. Um, they're working out the details. That's the main thing. Just work out the details, and after a few tries, they'll be doing it on a regular basis, I'm sure, just as they've been doing the other stuff in the past. So, Anyway, if you get a chance to check out these articles, all the links to these articles will be down underneath, and thank you everybody that, has sends, ends, that sends me links to, the, um, to help with the TDD report. It really does help a lot. So take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.